Hello and welcome to what the video title says this is. We're gonna implement a Redis cache together with a database so that we nicely distribute the workload between the database and a super fast caching layer with the example of Next.js, but this really works in any framework in JavaScript or even in other languages such as Python. So really quick, before we take a look at how to implement a caching layer with Redis, let's very briefly talk about what Redis even is. You've probably heard that Redis is an in-memory database, meaning in memory, you know, when you declare a constant in JavaScript, that's basically saved in memory. So it's not persisted anywhere. But Redis also persists to the disk, so you could even use it as an actual database. So say you have the client right here, the user client, the client makes a request currently to a database. The database lives over here and then the database returns the data back to the client. That's the architecture when we are not using Redis and want to persist data. And notice how the client makes a request to the database every time. So the workload is not distributed at all and the database has to serve every request with the according queries to the database. And depending on how large the database is, that can cost you a lot of quota on the database. With Redis, let's go down here, the architecture is a bit different. So we have the client right here, and then the client makes a request to the API route. Obviously the API route is called up here too, but it always calls the database, so it doesn't really make sense putting it in there. But the client makes a request to the API endpoint that we define. And the API endpoint now checks, is the data already in Redis, so in our caching layer, or is it not? Let's move them a bit like that. So the API checks with Redis. Let's say Redis lives up here, this is Redis. The API checks with Redis, do you already have this data in your store? And if you do, just send that back to the client right away. And if you don't have it in your store, then, so this is gonna be a Y for yes, and if you don't already have the data, so that's gonna be no, only then are we gonna query the database. And whenever that result from the database comes back to the API route, like that, that is being put into Redis. Um, so for the next request we make to the API route for the same data, the database is not gonna get queried, but instead this query right here, the Redis one is gonna return true. It's already gonna be in Redis so that the request will, will be served faster and without putting any workload on the database whatsoever. That's how Redis works. And let's now implement Redis in practice. We're gonna be using Upstash for this. Now Upstash is just a service that manages Redis for us and gives us a very nice CLI to interact with and handles also scaling of Redis for us. You don't have to use Upstash, but I'm gonna do in this video because they make it very convenient to work with a Redis database. If you want to follow along using Upstash, be sure to make an account. This is not sponsored by the way. I just genuinely like their service. And then let's click the create database button. Let's call this caching. This is gonna be a regional database and I'm gonna host this close to me which is an EU central one. You would want this to be as closest to your users as possible, not necessarily closest to you. We are gonna enable encrypted traffic and then let's click create or Redis database. Now the UI is very clean. The database is being prepared for us and that's literally all we have to do. Now we got our connection string and that is the um, string we need to connect to our Redis database. We could also use different uh, methods like the um, two different environment variables declared down here, but we are just going to copy the connection string right here and then let's go into our app. Let me zoom in so you can see this easier. And before getting into the database code of what I've just showed you as a concept, let's first initialize a Redis instance, right? And to do this, we can go into our lib, let's create a new file and then call this redis. TS. Now the reason I'm doing this in a folder called lib is because lib is usually used for preparing libraries to be used in your project. And now let's get started with creating our Redis instance so that we can then use it in our application to make everything more performant. And the way we do this is by first installing a dependency. And that dependency is called yarn add or npm install io redis. io redis, if you don't know yet, is a package, IO Redis. Let's go ahead and check it out on NPM really quick. It's a Redis client for Node.js, so it can be used on the server side. Got a bunch of installs, so many people are using it. It's high performance, it's pretty nice to use. 
That's why we are using IO Redis for this. We can start the dev server back up. And now because we've installed that dependency, let's close that down. We can say import and then Redis from IO Redis. And that is what we're going to use for our Redis client to initialize it. Now to initialize the client, we can write a little helper function called get Redis URL. And the only thing this function is going to do, and let's disable GitHub Copilot for this, is give us back the environment variable that we have set for the Redis connection string. The connection string, remember, that we got from Upstash. We want to save this as an environment variable because it is a sensitive piece of information and we don't want it leaked to the client side. That's why we are putting it into an environment variable. If the process.env.redis underscore URL this is what we are going to call this connection string. If that exists, then we are going to return that process.env.redis underscore URL. And this is only going to be true if we are on the service side, right? If we're on the client side, this process.env.redis URL is not going to exist. And that is in our best interest. So if it doesn't exist, we're going to throw a new error. This can say whatever you want. Let's just say redis underscore URL is not defined. And then to initialize our client, all we need to do is say const redis and export that. So export const redis this is going to be equal to and then a new redis, what we've imported up here from IO redis, and then pass in the get redis URL and invoke that. So that is going to give us back our process.env.redis URL if it exists. And if it doesn't exist, then it's going to throw an error so we know what's going on. And now in our .env, we are going to declare the redis underscore URL as the string we have just copied from Upstash. Now, because we have enabled encrypted traffic earlier, remember, we want to put a redis with a double S right here. So just like HTTPS or WSS for secure web sockets, this is the way that handles um, secure redis connections. And now we have enabled our client and are ready to work with it. Before we get to use the client though, Let's first take a quick look at this app right here. Let me um, pull up the server and then there's one single button. Let's have this side by side. That's a bit easier for you to see. There's one single button in this app and that is the get user. When we click this button, an API call is made th to the slash API slash user. It doesn't matter whether that's a Node.js API, Ruby, Python, this truly doesn't matter. I, go, I went with Node.js. And then inside of this folder, we are just querying our database to find a user, logging that out and then returning um, some kind of mock response. So when we click this button and take a look at the console, we can see in the console, we have found this user with an ID and the name, name of Lord Farquad from our database. And in the concept view that I showed you earlier, well, I don't have it open anymore, but you know, this would be the, the database is always queried without any caching involved. And that's not optimal because you're not distributing the workload, even if you already know um, the response, right? Because you've previously gave back that response. So it just makes sense to cache that. And now the way we cache that with Redis is super simple. We can say Redis, Redis and import that from our, from the lib file we have just created. And if we take a look at what we can access on this Redis um, property, there's a bunch of stuff we could use, right? But the most important things are the set and the get. And they do exactly what they promise. With redis.set, we can put new values, key value pairs into our database. So that means we could say redis.set hello, and we want hello to be of world, right? So this is the key and world would be the value that we save along with a key. Normally, we also want to await that because that is an asynchronous operation. And now let's try pressing on the button once again and seeing if it worked. We didn't get any error. So let's go into our Upstash data browser. And now we can see we've successfully created a string hello with um, the world content inside of it. Okay, so now that we know how to use Redis, let's see how we can optimize this backend. And we only want to query the database if the value is not in the cache already, right? So to check if the value is in the cache already, we could say const cached value is going to be equal to redis.get because that's how we get values from the database. And then we want to check if the user Lord Farquad 
already exists in our Redis cache. And if that user already exists, if this query was successful, because it comes back as either a string or null, and obviously we also need to await this operation because it is asynchronous, so we get back a string or null, the string in the success case and null if the Lord Farquaad value was not found. So if we have a cache value, then that means we can just return that to the user. There's no need to even query our database. So we can say return new response. And then here we can give back the cached value of Lord Farquaad. And if that doesn't exist, if the cache is not populated with that value, only then are we going to actually query the database. However, if we query the database, we want to ensure that this result is also stored in the cache, right? So we can say await redis.set, that's how we put values into a Redis cache. And then let's have Lord Farquaad as the user result that we have gotten back. And now the user might not exist, so we need to implement a guard clause here. If there is no user value, then we are going to return a new response of error, for example because this user does not exist. That way we can ensure that this user right here that we are trying to put into a Redis store is of type person. And the reason this is still giving an error is because we probably need to say json.stringify and then pass in the user. So we are turning this into a JSON string and then returning the new response of user found or the actual user. We could also pass that back as json.stringify and then pass the user in here. So that means the first time we try this, the Lord Farquaad is not going to be in our Redis cache, right? So the database will be queried. We can check that by just logging it out. Database was queried. And if the cache value was returned, we can say console log of cached value got returned. And that way we can see exactly what happened on the back end. So let's move this over into a side by side view again. And let's click the get user. Let's see what happens right here in the console. Oops, let's go back into here. And we can see that the database was queried, obviously, because the value wasn't in our cache. However, if the database was queried, then we set it into our cache. So it should be in our cache, right? Let's check the cache. Let's refresh this and we can see Lord Farquaad is now in our cache with an ID and the name, name of Lord Farquaad. So whatever, whenever we say get Redis string Lord Farquaad, then it will return the content that we have down here. Meaning that if we try this query again, this should now get the value from the cache. So we can say get user again. And now we can see in the console, the cached value got returned because it saw, okay, this value of Lord Farquaad already exists in our Redis cache. So there is no need to query the database again. Instead, we can just return this cached value to the user, which is A, faster, and then B, we are distributing the workload between our database and the Redis cache. And that is how we implement a cache in Next.js with Redis, which is super fast. As I said, it distributes the workload nicely. And that's all there is to it. I really hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one and bye bye.